Welcome to Bible Tract Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracts Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracts, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracts Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracts and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world, and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracts will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. Hello, my friend. Welcome to the program today, the Friday edition here at Bible Tract Echoes. Thanks so much for joining us. I pray that you have had a great week this week and your time, personal time with the Lord in his word and prayer has been very encouraging to you. And I pray you've had an opportunity this week to even communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone who does not as yet know Jesus as their savior. Well, right now my Bible is sitting open to the book of Leviticus in chapter 23. This will be our final day in this chapter, the book of Leviticus chapter 23. If you can reach over and pick up your own copy of God's word and join me there. Also, you may want to get something on which you can jot some notes as we do our study time together. I've got a gospel tract in my hand. Now, that word tract is spelled T-R-A-C-T, and I'm referring to a short written presentation of God's plan of salvation. This ministry, Bible Tract Echoes, is the radio arm of a larger ministry called Bible Tracts Incorporated, and we have been for 80 years, you heard me right, for 80 years, we've been publishing gospel tracts in different languages and literally giving them away all over the world to date to date. We can honestly, very, very conservatively say that a half a million people have come to know Jesus Christ in just the last 14 years. That's a great testimony to the power of God's word. So we want to put some gospel tracts in your hand. I'll tell you about that here in just a moment. Let me lead into the Bible study time this way. Does God have a future for the Jewish nation? The the people of the Jews. Oh, frankly, I believe that he does. And earlier this week, I mentioned that some of the various denominations in our world who all say they hold to the Bible as their authority, among them, there are some denominational labels, and those labels simply represent a doctrinal position on various issues, things like baptism, communion, and how a local church should function, and so on. Well, one of the issues that differentiates some some denominations is their view on prophecy. Actually, within the same denomination, there can be differences on prophecy. But the issue of the future of the nation of Israel is one of the things that can differentiate between born-again, Bible-believing folk. Now, I personally hold that the Old Testament promises and the Old Testament covenant, which God gave to the Jewish people, must be fulfilled just as it said. Not fulfilled by the New Testament church, but by the physical Jewish people who have a true heart in faith to Christ. Now, with that caveat, that little explanation, let me take us through the final three yearly feasts mentioned here in Leviticus chapter 23 and just deal with the fact that God does have a future for the nation of Israel. Get your Bible, please, and join us there. In my hand is one of those gospel tracts I mentioned a moment ago. This one's entitled, I'm Keeping the Golden Rule. I'm Keeping the Golden Rule. We publish this track for a very simple reason. So many people, they know what the golden rule is. Uh, they can give you a fairly decent explanation of it. Jesus said this, as you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But some people think that that is God's standard for getting into heaven. Do you know that Jesus did not say that to people who were not on their way to heaven? Jesus said that rule to people who had believed on him because they were on their way to heaven. Keeping the golden rule will not get anybody to heaven. Oh, it's a moral standard that I would love everybody to practice, although you and I know many people don't. 
and some people who claim Christ as Savior don't practice this rule. But friend, if you're trusting in the golden rule to um, be the tool by which God will measure you, I'm sorry, you're wrong. God's going to measure you by the standard of his son. You must be as perfect as he is. And if you fall short of that standard, no matter how much of the golden rule you've done, if you fall short of the standard of perfection found in Christ, you are in need of a savior because you're a sinner. This gospel track will explain that. Get it from us, please. At the end of the program, my announcer will give you ways by which you can give us your name and address, or you can just go to our website, which is BibleTracksInc.org. Well, if your Bible is open to Leviticus 23, let me read three verses. The first one, verse 24, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. That's one of the feasts. Verse 27 gives to the second one. Also, on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. One more verse, verse 34. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the month shall be a feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. Lord. We need to stop right there and do please pardon me for reading such a few number of verses, but our time of uh, explaining this passage is limited. God gave seven yearly feasts to the children of Israel. The first two explained or caused them to remember God's past salvation. The next two feasts caused the people to ponder God's ongoing or present preservation on God's present provision for them. Now these final three feasts were going to cause the Jewish people to focus on their future. These were to give them great hope. And the three feast times all came in the seventh month. And probably you already know that God makes a great deal out of the number seven, but I can't deal with that subject here right now. But these three feasts were in order, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of the Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Ingathering. It has many names. First of all, what about this Feast of Trumpets mentioned in verses 23, 24, and 25? Well, the seventh month for the Jews was the beginning of their civil year. At each new month, each new month, trumpets were always blown. But on the Feast of the Trumpets, this blowing of the ram's horns and these blowing of the silver trumpets went on all day. It was a very special new moon, a very special month. I believe that this feast connects with Jesus' teaching over in Matthew chapter 24, and particularly verse 31. In that verse, we learn that at the end of the seven years of tribulation period, God's going to send forth his angels with what? With the sound of a trumpet. The verse says that all true and believing Jews will be called together and they will at the this will all happen at the second coming of Jesus. Jesus will come and set up his millennial reign, his 1000 year reign here on earth. For the Jews year by year they were called together. Why? Well, that brings us to the next feast, the Day of Atonement. And this is found here in verses 26 through 32. Verse 32 says the Day of Atonement was a day to afflict their souls. That By that, they were to humble their souls before God. They were to see how great their need was to find a cleansing for the sins on their heart. So 10 days after blowing the trumpet, the people would fast rather than feast. On that day, all personal work would be set aside except for the work of the high priest. On the day of atonement, the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies. He went in with the blood of the sin offering. He, the high priest, did a work all by himself on behalf of all the people. His offering covered the sins of the people that had not been dealt with by other sacrifices done throughout that year. But the only problem was that the benefits of the high priest's offering lasted only one year. 
This special holy day pointed to, obviously, the future time in which God would provide a once-for-all sacrifice for their sin. And that happened, obviously, in the person of Jesus Christ. But at Jesus' second coming, God's going to purify all believing Jews because thousands of Jews will have received Jesus as their Messiah Savior during the tribulation period. This leads to the last feast, the Feast of the Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. This one happened after their harvest time was all over, so therefore it's often called the Feast of Ingathering. Now, five days after the Day of Atonement, the Jews would spend a week living out of their houses in booths, which are just simply uh, small shelters made of branches and leaves. Verse 43 of our chapter tells us that God wanted them to do this so that the generations to come would remember how God had helped Israel as they left Egypt and led them on their way to the promised land. These shelters were not to give off the idea of poorness, but they were a symbol of provision and help and God's care for them. There are two key Bible passages that you need to know that tie into this Feast of Tabernacles. One of them is found in the book of Zechariah chapter 14, the very last verses of that book. There, the Jews were told that in the millennial age, they would still be celebrating this feast. At that time, all of Israel and all of their daily utensils. By utensils, I mean things like their pots and pans and even their horses' bridles. All of this would be declared to be holy unto the Lord, sacred unto the Lord. This seven-day feast was to remind the Jews that they belonged to God and that their daily care and protection was God's personal responsibility. The other passage to connect here is in the Gospel of John, chapter 7. In John 7, Jesus himself attends the Feast of the Tabernacles. And on the final day, Jesus boldly cries out, interrupts part of the ceremony that the priests were doing, and to say this, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. The next verse there in John 7 says that out of Jesus would come a a river of living water. For any Jewish person or any Gentile, for that matter, to be part of the millennial age, they will have to have taken a drink of the living water where Jesus alone provides salvation. He is the water of life. That water is the water of salvation from sin. So, With that being done, that being said, then I have to ask you, have you taken a drink out of Jesus' well of salvation? Have you taken a drink of his living water? If you have not, then you are not saved from your sin. This living water is simply another picture of how the cleansing power of Jesus' shed blood cleanses us from all sin. All are sinners and need a Savior The salvation for their sinful deeds is only found in Jesus. We must receive him personally to have everlasting life. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Tract Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracts, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracts, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.